Manumen. The translation is uh, the good seed. I've been involved in uh, wild rice restoration out on Lac Pitezera, our homeland waters, uh, our home territory, uh, since 1972. My mentor and, and my grandparents, my uncle, took me to uh, the rice beds in northern Wisconsin. My uncle had this, this vision that he, he would like to uh, reintroduce Manumen to our home community because both my grandparents and my mentor, my uncle, seen a lot of the knowledge from the sacred gift uh, as part of our identity was slipping away from our community. Right now, I'm the uh, delegate on the Michigan Wild Rice Initiative to help start addressing some of these uh, Minuman issues. Not only did that, it help me find out who I was, but it also provided me with the knowledge and the stories about this wild rice. It has been given to me that I pass on this knowledge not only to, to my family, to my community, but to all indigenous people, and not to be uh, guarding of it, but to make it available to all, all people. Before uh, 1492, before we were uh, approached by the, those Western people, they were given um, seven prophecies. The first prophecy was is that we needed to head to that place where that sun sets, which is the west. In the third prophecy, it said that we needed to follow that cowrie shell to the place where the food grows on the water. And this is that food that grows on the water. And when we found this food that grows on the water, we would know our new home. This water here is part of the uh, Great Lakes watershed. And this water here will actually end up in time out in the Atlantic Ocean. So the communities would gather twice a year to make sure that they had two of the staple foods. First being manumen, to make sure that they had enough. The other staple food that they had was uh, the maple sugar that they took from the sugar bush. And so the communities come to rely on those two staple foods because in those harsh winters when they were unable to go out and hunt and provide food, as long as they had manumen and they had maple sugar, they could stay in their lodges and not starve, but continue on with life. The normal harvesting Season is just like any, anything else, uh, like in your garden. Uh, it's at the end of summer. In order for you to get the, the best possible wild rice is to get the rice that is ripe and ready. Before you put your canoe in the water, before you, you know, jump in it and come out here, you offer your SEMA and you talk to all these beings that are out here, tell them what you're gonna do, thank them for it. And what I always ask is to give me only what I need, not to be greedy. I save a lot of this other stuff for those ones that will follow me. But also, those winged ones are gonna become dependent on this to make, to make sure that they're healthy as they make their migration south. That's another reason that uh, the Creator doesn't make all, these, all this ripen at one time. Those winged ones, they, they have to build up that, that reservoir and that stamina to make sure that they're going to make it to, to Mexico, South America, or, or down south, wherever they're going, whether it be the geese or whatever. We have a code of the proper way to harvest this rice. Uh, it's with these, with these knockers, with that push pull in a canoe that's no longer than 36 inches wide or 17 feet long. But that's only enforced on a tribal members. Anybody who wants to come and get some of this 
can do it by any means that they feel they need to come out here and try to get it. You need uh, a set of uh, ricing sticks. And there's a slang called, called for given to these and they're called knockers. And the reason that they're called knockers is because you're actually knocking the ripe rice off these heads into the bottom of the canoe. Your ricing stick, depending on which state you're in, is either 36 or 39 inches. Both of these together cannot weigh more than one pound. What we actually make this um, so ricing stick out is out of cedar, white cedar. And white cedar is uh, uh, one of the sacred medicines. The other thing that uh, a lot of the recommendations would, would be to fall in line uh, and to be being consistent and conform to especially tribal rules is your jiman or your canoe. Our regulations state that your canoe cannot be wider than 36 inches, so you can put your ricing stick up on the part of your canoe at the widest point and make sure that it's not over 36 inches. The only way that you can propel your canoe uh, through a rice bed is with a push pole. And that push pole is made out of, um, ideally, if you can find a tamarack, uh, which is the most durable, the most uh, strong, and uh, most dependable, spruce, balsam, and, uh, and cedar. But all four of them grow very straight. Not only do they grow very straight, but when they're dried out, they're very, very light. A push pole can be anywhere from somewhat effective 12 feet, but it can go up to 18 feet. You need a fork at the end of your pole because where wild rice grows, the bottom is very organic and very soft. So if you're just using a pole, you're just gonna push your pole down into sediment. And when you push your pole in down into the sediment, it has a tendency to stick. And so when you try to get it out of the sediment, you have the opportunity to become displaced from your canoe. <laughs> You lean, this, you lean this over and you just gently and only get the right price. Let it stand back up so that this seed head will ripen. A lot of people mistake this plant as being a perennial plant, but it's not a perennial plant. It's an annual plant. Each one of these plants has a life cycle of one year. Its life cycle begins when it falls from this seed head, when it is ripe, when it is mature. It can be taken off from uh, this seed head in several ways. It could be taken off by the, the Thunderbirds. It could be taken off not only um, from the rain itself, but the winds the winds that blow this back and forth. The, the best harvester is that guy upstairs when he, when he sends those thunderbirds. Or you can come out there when we, we come out here and we start rustling these bushes. As we start doing this and start doing this, you know, not all the seed that we get comes in here. When this falls, this tail acts like a rudder. And so when it falls, you can see it almost like a, like a torpedo. So when it, the seed don't go down like this and everything, the seed will fall down into the bottom. And this bottom is uh, very organic, very soft. Every seed that falls down into that seed bank germinates over the winter. And so as Mother Earth sleeps and a cold comes in, and that ice comes over these waters and cools it down, this seed starts to germinate. And actually the ice leaves, it allows the grandfather, that sunlight, to penetrate this water. It breaks through and goes down and starts warming up the waters 
warming up the water so that, that this starts putting a tap root down. And as that water starts to recede to its normal levels from the spring runoff, that cold water, then the, the temperatures start to warm up. This will put up a tiller, and it has what you call a floating leaf stage, or a, a floating leaf. When that gets up and it has that floating leaf, this will start to uh, produce the secondary root system. So that, that secondary root system comes out this way so that it, it goes into that bottom and it anchors. It, it'll stand, stand strong and firm. And then in June and into July, it, it'll start pulling up, putting up these tillers from the water. So one seed can put up one tiller with this seed head, or it can put up to seven. Then in, in July, it'll, it'll enter into the flowering stage. The, the male flowers are really, really big and they're, and they're colorful, yellow and orange. But when you look at the flower on this female, it's just really small. It almost looks like a, a tuft of an eagle feather. So it doesn't take much pollen to pollinate the seed. As this plant reacts to that wind, this female plant comes in contact with that male part right here and becomes pollinated. And again, it don't take very much. One of the gifts that the Creator gave is because, well, not only is it for the Anishinaabe people, but a lot of the winged ones, a lot of the four-legged ones, the, like the muskrat, like the, the beaver, a lot of the other beings that, that live in and around um, this, the ducks, the geese. And that's why it was important to, to our ancestors is that because when they found a very, very good bed of uh, benumen, it enabled them not only to harvest this in the fall, but it helped them with the fish, with the muskrats and everything else that, that they needed. It brought that, those, those uh, things uh, to them. Whether it be this water spirit, whether it be a key, Mother Earth, and giving its nutrients, or if it's Mishomis, that grandfather's son. Or if it's that wind, or if it's that, that thunderbirds. All those beings, it takes all those things to make this. Our stories tell us that this is the only place on Mother Earth that Zizania uh, palustris grows, Zizania aquatica grow is in the Great Lakes Basin. And the Great Lakes Basin is known for the largest freshwater source on Mother Earth. Even the Western science world consider this a key species because of when it's here, the impact to the habitat and to the environment. When it is gone, you also look at the impact when this isn't here and what it does to the habitat and to the wildlife and to the community that, that's left behind. This is an indicator that the water quality is one of the best and what it's known for as the uh, water of the, the Great Lakes system. This plant, this Manitou Gittigan, this spirit garden has a spirit and it has uh, provided us with uh, a sacred gift. It has become uh, a staple food of my ancestors. Uh, our communities today need to move forward in trying to make sure that this monument is always available to the community in remembrance of where we came and why we're here. <laughs>